and we must now move on to questions to the Minister for the Environment. And I call Mr. Alex Easton. Mr. Easton. Question number one, Mr. Minister. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I would like to combine the answers to question one and question four. Driver licensing is a transferred matter under the Northern Ireland Act 1998. Under the provisions of the Road Traffic Northern Ireland Order 1981, my department has responsibility for a broad range of matters relating to the licensing of vehicle drivers, including the form of the driving licence. In 2012, when the UK Government announced its intention to include the Union flag on Great Britain driving licences, Department for Transport Minister Mike Penning wrote to my predecessor to advise him of this intention. Minister Penning's letter noted that driver licensing is a devolved matter, but that DVLA prints our driving licences under contract. Minister Penning indicated his intention that DVLA would continue to print Northern Ireland driving licences without change to the existing design. He asked for a view on this. Further to this correspondence, officials in my department engaged with DVLA to ascertain whether it would be possible to provide individuals with an option to choose whether to include or exclude the flag. DVLA, however, indicated that this would not be possible as the costs involved in making the system and associated changes required to offer such a choice were prohibitive. The same approach has, I note, been taken in Britain. The flag will be applied to all GB driving licences with no ability for individuals to opt in or opt out. Having considered the issue, the response to DFT in December 2012 confirmed with agreement with DFT's intention to continue to print NI driving licences without any change to the existing design. Given that no change was brought forward, no further consultation occurred. My department heard no more of the UK government's plans for GB driving licences until a letter from DFT Minister John Hayes to me dated the 23rd of December 2014. Order. Am I assuming that the Minister really needed extra time? I apologise for not uh, pointing that out at the start, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I have combined two questions here and two answers, so extra time is much appreciated and required. A letter from DFT Minister John Hayes to me dated the 23rd of December 2014, indicating that the plans for the GB licences would be announced over the Christmas period and that Northern Ireland driving licences would continue to be issued without the Union flag. Call Mr Easton for supplementary. Could I thank the Minister for his answer? Could I ask the Minister why he didn't consult with the Executive? And does he not realise by pulling this stunt that he has offended over half the population of Northern Ireland? And it's now up to him to apologise to the people of Northern Ireland for not allowing the Union flag on our driving licences because I hold the Minister responsible for this and I think he's stuck in and diving. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thanks, I think, to Mr Easton for that supplementary. I'm not sure how much of a supplementary it is, though, or whether or not the question was written before my previous answer. I thought I outlined quite clearly that this was not a decision taken by me. Uh, I have not consulted or did not consult with executive colleagues. Driver licensing is a transferred matter for which the Department of Environment is responsible. Since no change of policy was proposed and the matter was not and is not cross-cutting, no consultation with ministerial colleagues was necessary. I'm not ducking and diving at all on this matter. I, and I know the vast majority of the general public will be looking upon this today as they were listening to the radio a, a couple of weeks ago when this story broke, just in sheer disbelief that a day after hearing about a budget that's going to result in thousands of job losses, massive cuts to public spending, we're hearing this morning of our most vulnerable pensioners having to rely on frozen meals and wheels, a fortnight's worth of frozen uh, fr fr frozen meals, yet we are here today talking about and arguing about flags. There's been a lot of lecture, lecturing of late in this chamber 
and outside of it on the need for political maturity. I would ask, where is the political maturity here and where is the immaturity? Well, Mrs. Brenda Hale, and remind members, the rules are still the same here. Whatever the subject is, you do not shout from a sedentary position. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I don't know whether to thank the Minister for that very diverting answer or not, but can the Minister then advise me who said that consultation wasn't needed, given that this is a sensitive subject and that the people should decide and it shouldn't be an, SDLD, an SDLP policy? Yeah. <clears throat> I thank uh, the member for her supplementary. As there were no changes made to the current driving licence, there was no need to issue a public consultation. I'm not sure when the DUP became champions of and champions for consultation. I'm not sure how much stead they pay or regard they pay to consultation. I couldn't help but hear a news item on the radio this morning around flags again, surprise, surprise, in Craig Gavin Council, where a consultation was held. And the response to that consultation overwhelmingly stated that there should be no flag flown. However, that was completely ignored. So I don't know, do you, uh, the DUP favour consultation or not? Sorry, final warning to some members who are still shouting from a sedentary position. They may find in future they will not be called. I call Mrs Sandra Overend. Deputy Speaker, and, uh, uh, for a party that espouses equality, uh, unfortunately the Minister has let himself down in this regard. I wonder, can the Minister tell us, is it too late to go back to the DVLA and the Department of Transport at Westminster and ask for an opt-out option? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank Ms Overend uh, for her supplementary. As outlined in my answer to the initial questions, that case was made to uh, DFT by DOE officials, they proactively sought an opt-out or opt-in option. However, the option option was not an option and is not an option in GB, <laughs> in, in GB either. We're, much to the ire, I might add, add uh, of Scottish and Welsh nationalists who would rather not have the union flag on their licence. And I know that's the subject of an early day motion in the House of Commons from Plaid Cymru on this. Well, Mr. Colm Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, I think a question that might matter to some people uh, in Northern Ireland. In terms of the DVA jobs that were lost and all the promises that were made by other uh, and all the ministers uh, around the executive table to bring and decentralise jobs to that area, how many jobs were decentralised and by which departments? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the member for his pertinent and relevant question, a question that will be relevant to me and relevant to people outside of here as well. The issue around the DVLA and them assuming responsibility for the delivery of vehicle licensing services is well documented and, and well rehearsed in, in this chamber. However, we all know and are all aware that over 300 jobs were lost, and here, here we are talking about flags. In conjunction with the Finance Minister, I might add, we asked all departments to explore what ability they might have to find jobs for those affected. Unfortunately, no jobs were found by any department, with the exception of 100 temporary jobs from uh, DSD, which have now passed. Uh, from within my own department, I was able to find work for 120 of these people. However, I'm, I'm sorry to say that that was it. With the executive's ag agreement, we were able to set up a voluntary exit scheme confined to the North West uh, to assist those who had uh, lost their job as a result of the centralisation. And the uptake on this has been huge, it has to be said with over 500 people expressing an interest right across the, the, the civil service of trying to get out, if you like, depending on what's on the table. Uh, that's currently been looked at by the DFP. Well, Mr Barry Michael Duff. 
Following on from Mrs. Overend's reference to the word equality, does the Minister agree that in this matter, and in all matters to do with symbols and emblems, that the underlying principle for his department and all departments should be equality or neutrality? I thank uh, the, the member for his uh, question. Equality should be at the core of what everything, not just my department does, everything that we do individually and particularly collectively as an assembly. The Good Friday states that all participants acknowledge the sensitivity of the use of symbols and emblems for public purposes and the need in particular in creating the new institutions to ensure that such symbols and emblems are used in a manner which promotes mutual respect rather than division. Arrangements will be made to monitor this issue and consider what action might be required. Taking account of this, I believe that it was appropriate for my predecessor to retain the status quo rather than seek to introduce additional symbols and emblems onto the driving licence. I believe the decision was a sensitive one and I believe that it was a sensible one. I call Mr Fergal McKinney for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number two. I am fully committed to working across government and with all sectors of our society to agree on measures that can help to address both current and future climate change. I chair the Cross-Departmental Working Group on Climate Change, which is responsible for developing and implementing the wide range of policies and measures that each department has committed to in our action plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This includes key actions from my own department, such as, first, by continuing to de develop and implement the EU emissions trading scheme and the carbon reduction commitment, both of which aim to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions from those organisations that use the most energy. Second, by introducing new waste policies and strategies and providing support to local authorities to help achieve much higher recycling rates, which will reduce emissions from landfill sites. Third, by changes to planning policy to ensure that planning decisions take account of climate change impacts before any development is approved. And fourth, by the use of voluntary prosperity agreements with strategic organisations which explore novel ways to work together to deliver economic and environmental benefits. Furthermore, I have also published the North's first climate change adaptation programme which sets out measures to be taken to address the highest priority risks from climate change. Whilst all of this progress is welcome, I also recognise that further work on climate change remains to be done if we are to achieve my vision of a better environment and a stronger economy. I firmly believe that legislation can play a significant part in delivering on that vision, and that is why I am continuing to look at how best to progress a climate change bill. Call Mr. McKinney for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank uh, the Minister for his fulsome answer. Uh, could he explain to the House why he thinks it is so important to legislate on climate change? Well, as I said in my previous answer, and as I constantly say, I have constantly and consistently say that my vision is for a better environment and a stronger economy. Given the dynamics of today's global economy, the threat of climate change should not be viewed as just an environmental challenge, but also as an economic opportunity. The low carbon market for environmental goods and services is vast, and it's growing fast. Globally, it's currently estimated to be worth four trillion pounds. Businesses and organizations that do and can recognize this opportunity will create social, economic, and environmental prosperity for all our people. I believe that having our own climate change legislation would provide greater clarity and the long-term certainty which business and industry need, creating the environment to drive and encourage innovation, to effectively plan and invest in the technology needed, and to generate employment as we make the transition towards a low-carbon economy, and in doing so, deliver a better environment 
and a stronger economy. Well, Mr Mickey Brady. Um, given the increasing instances of uh, flooding in our local communities, something which the people of Newry uh, unfortunately experienced recently, could I ask the Minister what role his department is playing in partnership with other government departments and public bodies to alleviate the worst impact of this, this flooding? Gormaygat. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank Mr Brady for that question. I'm well aware of the incidents of late in Newry and the difficulty that has caused for people living and working in that area. And while I have been able to provide some assistance through my department in terms of emergency flood payments, I would rather not have to do that because we would rather avoid the flooding in the first place. It is important that we build resilience and maximise the benefits from our changing climate. My department published a Northern Ireland Climate Change Adaptation Programme last January. The programme presents a proportionate and flexible response to the impacts of climate change here, and it focuses on new and existing policies within government under the primary areas of water, flooding, agriculture and forestry, and natural environment. The adaptation programme will help government departments become more aware of and more resilient to climate change impacts in the future. My department is continuing to take the lead in ensuring that we continue to adapt and be better prepared for future changes in, in our climate and the extreme weather events associated with that. We are working with other departments to measure the performance of the current adaptation programme and obtain more local information and data to develop the next adaptation programme in 2019. Call Climate change regulations can increase energy costs and also contribute to uh, fuel poverty. So care is, is required. Uh, would the Minister accept, when, when I think about the, the All Ireland study into bitumous coal, that, and also at the same time of a constituent who relies on uh, a coal farm because they cannot afford an oil fill, that great care must be made uh, to ensure that there are not inconsistent outcomes that leads to greater fuel poverty in Northern Ireland? Uh, thank uh, Mr Beggs for that question. The subject which he raises is the subject of a debate in the Assembly later today. And in response to a media query this morning, I actually said that Sammy Wilson, who has brought the debate, is jumping the gun a bit. So I think Mr Beggs is jumping the gun even further uh, in that respect. But the point he raises is a fair enough one. I think it is vitally important that a balance is struck and a balance at least is sought between conservation requirements and commercial and domestic realities, what people actually need to do. Evidence is that solid fuel, uh, to which the member refers, does have a detrimental impact not only on our environment but also on human health. With regards to the, the study, that he is re referring to the All Ireland uh, study of the impact on smoky coal. That has not been published yet, let alone me have time to consider the recommendations in that report yet. However, I will go into that in more detail in the Assembly later on today. Well, Mr. Cattle Boylan for a question. Question number three, Led Hall. Question number three, please. Following executive approval in late October to establish the partnership panel, the first meeting took place on the 2nd of December and focused on a number of issues, including a stock take on the local government reform programme, the budget situation for local government, agreement on the terms of reference and standing orders, and initial discussion and plans for developing a joint central and local government work plan, as well as supporting arrangements for the panel going forward. It is my sense from the inaugural meeting that members recognise the potential for a strong working partnership between executive ministers, councils from the new 11 councils and NILGA's office bearers as local government's representative body. I feel there is a general consensus that the work of the partnership panel is to develop joined up solutions, capitalise on opportunities and ultimately improve the delivery of local services. As chair, I feel that joint policy development and better operational collaboration
will help us strategically tackle the issues that really matter to local people. The appointment of the panel is timely, as with only weeks remaining to the assumption of powers by the new councils on the 1st of April, the new councils will be taking on bigger challenges with the transfer of planning, local economic development, local tourism and the introduction of new community planning powers. Bringing this family of powers together within councils is significant and will enable local government to adopt a more comprehensive approach to dealing with local needs and priorities. My aim is that the work of the partnership panel will complement and support this process in the coming months. Subject to a meeting with the Finance Minister, I want to hold the next meeting of the partnership panel in February. Besides having a more substantive conversation on strategic business for the work plan, I will be seeking input from executive ministers and local government members to the next agenda. Call Mr. Boylan for a supplementary. For me, Margaret, uh, you ask him for the, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And the minister did sound positive in his response, but could I ask the minister how confident, confident is he that other ministers will fully engage and participate in this panel? For me, Margaret. I uh, thank uh, the, the member for the supplementary question. I think it is vitally important that all ministers do engage. Uh, quite a few ministers did turn up to the inaugural meeting of, of the partnership. However, I am cognizant of the fact that ministers, including myself, not apart from myself, do have pretty uh, busy diaries. But local government representatives there want to see the ministers and I can see as the partnership grows legs and has further meetings into the future that ministers will attend or will be required to attend depending upon what is on the agenda for that meeting and how relevant it is to them or their department. Now I am or was heartened by the input to the ministers who did uh, come to the first meeting. I think it is vitally important that for our next meeting we have additional uh, ministers at the, the meeting. That is why I have not set a precise date for the meeting yet. I want to make sure that I can have in attendance the Finance Minister uh, in particular, given that a lot of the questions being asked by the partnership panel would be better being answered by him rather than me. Call Mr Danny Kinahan. Can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? When we're talking about growing legs, I wonder if it could grow legs in a, a different direction. Does he see the partnership panel being able to call on or having on it outside bodies? And I would raise one like the Social Enterprise Northern Ireland, who very much the role that they're involved with with this chamber is now moving to councils and yet still exists a little bit in both. Will there be room in the flexibility of this panel to include people from the outside or to call them in? Uh, the, the amount of room will depend on how many ministers uh, turn up. I do not think that the partnership panel is the correct forum for uh, s such bodies. However, I am sure they will be more than welcome around the tables in the various uh, new councils and their new community planning uh, regime. Their input would be most valued in that respect. The partnership panel itself was created to provide a kind of political level where discourse can happen between local government and central government vis-a-vis -vis the executive ministers. I think that is very important. I hope that it is very fruitful and I hope that the people living out there in all our council areas see the fruits of that before too long. Call Mr Alex Atwood. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister what opportunities does he believe the partnership panel might have in tackling a disadvantage in areas of need? And would he agree that whatever its role, the rug has been pulled from under its feet by the decision last week uh, through the Tory budget to do further damage to rates relief to areas of disadvantage and areas of need? How can the partnership panel now try to mitigate what others have imposed upon areas of disadvantage in Northern Ireland. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the, the member for his question. The point which uh, the member makes in his question, I think, alludes almost directly 
to the impact that uh, the budget that was revealed to the House yesterday via the DFP Minister's uh, statement on the rates support grant, which goes to and supports less well-off councils, uh, those with a poorer rates base, it allows them to deliver the same quality or at least a similar quality of services as uh, their wealthier counterparts. The fact is that as of and due to the budget that my department has received, the rate support grant will become a thing of the past. That is something that causes me huge frustration and it is something I am sure that is causing those councils and will cause them great distress and it is something that will cause their ratepayers and their citizens great hardship. And that is something that I do not think is a, a satisfactory situation at all. The issue itself was raised on numerous occasions with me at the inaugural uh, meeting of the partnership panel. That is why I think it is important that the Finance Minister is also able to be, to be in attendance, albeit that the consultation on the budget period has now closed. I think it is very important that he hears firsthand the concerns of local government and the impact that these cuts are going to have on their most vulnerable people. Mr. Dominic Bradley for a question. Tiver Kuig, uh, I'll ask on call your question number five. My programme for the transfer of planning powers to local government is on track for completion on the 1st of April this year. Preparations for transfer have involved a major programme of work which is well advanced. This includes a broad range of subordinate legislation required to bring the 2011 Planning Act fully into operation and to establish the new two-tier planning system. Public consultation on this legislation was taken forward in two stages and the final stage closed on the 31st of December. My officials are currently considering the responses. The necessary policy framework is also being introduced. Work to finalise the new strategic planning policy statement is now at a very advanced stage and I intend to bring it to the executive shortly. Over the past four months, my department has been delivering an extensive capacity building programme for local government. This has included training sessions covering an overview of the planning system, development plans and working with the community, practical planning and propriety and outcomes. In addition to the local government programme, an ongoing capacity building programme is also being delivered for planning staff. In addition to the structured capacity building programme, Advice and guidance is being finalised on a wide variety of planning related matters. This includes guidance on the planning element of the Councillor's Code of Conduct, the operation of planning committees and practice notes on the operation of the reformed two-tier system. My department has taken steps to ensure that the necessary systems and structures are in place for the successful transfer of planning functions. Whilst that programme is on track, there is still work to be done. My staff are working closely with the local government sector to ensure that all transitional arrangements are in place and also to ensure the necessary practical issues relating to matters such as accommodation, IT and communications are addressed. I am confident that the reforms introduced over the past year, together with the changes coming in the coming months, will ensure a fast, fair and fit for purpose planning system transfers in a couple of months' time. Call Mr Bradley for supplementary. Um, I thank the, the Minister for his question. Uh, but could I ask him uh, when he uh, will exercise the call-in mechanism uh, in respect of planning decisions taken by local government? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'd like to thank Mr. Bradley for that interesting and pertinent question. Under the planning reform programme, Councils will be the planning authorities in their respective council areas responsible for determining the vast majority of planning applications. Section 29 of the Planning Act 2011 allows the Department to direct that certain planning applications be referred to it instead of being dealt with by the Council. 
In recognising and respecting the important role of councils in making decisions on the future development of their areas, the Department would only envisage this power being exercised in ex exceptional circumstances. It is not my role, and certainly not my intention, to micromanage district council decision-making on planning applications. However, there may be circumstances where a proposed development raises issues of such regional importance or strategic interest that the application should be called in for the Department, in effect, to take over the role of decision-maker. Order. That ends the period for listed questions, and we will now move on to topical questions. And I call Ms. Claire Sugden. Mr. Speaker, um, further to a written question, I'd asked you in respect to the DVA jobs, um, and you'd mentioned earlier about um, identifying uh, jobs from a voluntary redundancy scheme. Could I ask the minister how many jobs does he think will um, go to people in the DVA from that scheme? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to thank Ms. Sogden for that uh, question. As I said, there's been uh, quite a, a degree of interest in the voluntary exit scheme that, with the agreement of the executive, we were able to establish to assist those primarily in uh, the members' constituency affected by the centralisation uh, of these DVA jobs. I, I I think in the region of 500 people have expressed an interest in the exit scheme and uh, their re requests or expressions of interest are currently being processed. That is the only level of detail I have, I am afraid. For uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister seems somewhat satisfied by the number of uh, people who have applied for voluntary redundancy. Um, does that therefore suggest that there is not a need for involuntary redundancies in this respect? Uh, let me uh, assure the member that I am not satisfied that there had to be redundancy of any nature, but also let me assure her that it does mean that in, at this occasion and in this instance there will not be any requirement for involuntary redundancy uh, on the back of the erroneous decision taken in Whitehall to uh, move the jobs, again largely in Coleraine, to Swansea. Well, Mr Sean Lynch for topical question. Could I ask the Minister what plans are in place to ensure councils do not have to uh, cover the cost for those new functions that are being transferred? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I uh, thank Mr Lynch uh, for that question. It has long been the point, or at the heart of local government reform, is about creating efficiencies. Creating efficiencies, not just for councils, but for their ratepayers. And I have stated since taking office, and my predecessor did before I took office, that any functions transferring to local <coughs> government should do so on the basis of, the, of being cost neutral to the ratepayer. I have, uh, as DOE Minister, certainly honoured my agreement that what is transferring should do so on a cost-neutral basis by ring-fencing the budget associated with the function of planning. In fact, it is my belief, firm belief, although they probably dispute the fact, undoubtedly dispute the fact, that when it comes to planning, local government is actually getting a good deal. Unfortunately, I can't say the same about some of the other functions uh, transferring. I know. Uh, Doubts have been raised uh, from, from some of the new councils uh, uh, around some of the functions transferring to them and potential cost implications. However, all of this had been worked out. Numerous studies, reports and surveys have been done in conjunction uh, with local government. I believe, however, it is still incumbent upon us to ensure that what is going over is fit for purpose and that it does not become an albatross around any of the new councils next. Mr Lynch for supplementary. Um, going quickly, I want to thank the Minister for his 
answer. Has the Minister sought the views of the councils themselves in this regard, and what, are they satisfied with arrangements that have been put in place? I, I, I thank uh, the member for the, the supplementary. I didn't have to seek them, <laughs> that, that's for sure. Uh, the local government sector certainly isn't backward about coming forward with concerns that they have about a range of issues. I did allude to the fact that in my earlier answer that there were some functions that they were particularly uh, concerned about, and I know we're currently seeing the transfer of off-street car parking bill uh, working its, its way through the House here, and that's one that has started rightly or wrongly, some alarm bells ringing across the council areas, some more so than others. I have done my utmost, as of my officials, to assure the, the, the councils that they are getting a fair deal here. It's only natural that concerns will exist. We're going into a period of huge change, and it's vitally important, though, that councils don't feel that we're just giving them X, Y and Z and casting them adrift, but that we maintain close working relationships and are able to provide them the support, not necessarily always financial support, but to deal with and work the, the new functions that they acquire. Call Mr Tom Elliott for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And, um, just wondering if the Minister could give us an update on where the process of rate convergence is. Uh, for those councils that are merging and have a significant rate differential. And I'm wondering how that process has been taken forward and uh, how it's going to be distributed to the councils. Uh, I thank the, the member uh, for that question. As a long-serving member of the Environment Committee, he will be aware of the good work done by my predecessor in this regard and that he was able to go to the executive, make the argument and uh, acquire the funding to assist some of the new councils with these uh, rates convergence issues. £30 million, in fact, to be distributed to those councils most affected by uh, amalgamation over a period of three or four years. Work is still ongoing. It's a very complex issue. There are quite a lot of various formula, formulae and that uh, to be looked at, however, it's vitally important that that work is brought to a conclusion sooner rather than later, particularly as councils sit trying to strike their, their rate for next year. It's worth being reminded, though, that this uh, rates relief, in effect, that was secured by Alex Atwood from the executive previously, it will benefit the rate payer, and it's the rate payer who will see the saving. Or well, sorry won't see the increase rather than lining uh, the, the coffers of the Council. Tell you for supplement. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the Minister for that uh, update. Just wondering uh, what his terminology of sooner is. Uh, is sooner a month, is it two months or is it three months? And what involvement there has been with the councils themselves in developing the process as it goes forward? I, I, I can assure the member that the councils have been very closely involved in this process, as he knows they have been throughout the whole process of reform. Sometimes they'd like more involvement, sometimes they don't become as involved as we might like them to. My definition of sooner is as soon as possible. I don't have an exact timeline here with me today. However, I do recognise the need for speed on this issue. However, greater than the need for speed is the need for accuracy. Ms. Anna Lowe for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister give an indication of how the final budget is going to impact on his department? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to thank Ms. Lowe, the Chairperson of the Environment uh, Committee, for that question that I thought might never come. Under the final budget for 2015-16, the Department's non-ring-fenced resource DL budget was reduced by 10.7 per cent. 
the highest percentage reduction of any department. This is something that's going to have a massive impact on the department's ability to deliver services. I've answered earlier questions with regard to the impact of this on grants to councils, particularly the, the rates support grant. However, the department gives out a lot more grants than that, and uh, Ms. Lowe will be well aware of many of the organisations, good organisations, in receipt of those grants. I was very uh, heartened last week, however, to attend an event at the invitation of Ms. Lowe uh, that comprised of many of the environmental NGOs, and there is at least a recognition across those organisations that they are going to need to change the way that they do their good work as a result of the Department's inevitable inability to uh, fund them as much as we have in the past going into the future. Ms. Lowe for supplement. I uh, want to thank the Minister for his answer and as well as uh, turning up at the event uh, at last minute uh, request. Um, it, 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 I'm, I'm in a way speechless about this Minister. As you know, we are very concerned as a committee about the loss, potential loss of staff. 500 posts are going to go. I just wonder how are you going to manage this, particularly this is about one third of your workforce and many of whom are professional and technical staff. So how are you going to function with one third of your staff leaving? I uh, thank Ms Lowe uh, for that question. <laughs> I wish I had a, a, an answer for it. Obviously, this budget creates huge difficulties, and I know DOE, while I lament the fact that we have been hit harder than any other department, but every minister is going to be in a similar position, and it, it, it's not a nice place to be. However, not only are we at risk of losing 500 posts from within the department, the grants that I referred to earlier that support NGOs, that support other environmental groups who are doing hugely valuable work, helping us as a government, helping us as a, as a place to meet our programme for government targets, to meet targets coming from Europe in terms of environmental uh, performance. There's going to be an inevitable impact on employment within those groups as well, and their ability to employ, again, professional, technical and scientific staff. So I think the 500 posts that we're talking about is really just the tip of the iceberg. I did refer to the positivity at that event uh, which we attended last week and a recognition or acceptance among the NGOs that they need to work together. But what I was very much appealing to them is that they need to work together with us as a department and we have to be a lot more imaginative and a lot more creative about how we use the ever-reducing resources that we have in order to achieve the best environmental outcomes. Well, Mr Jimmy Spratt for a topical. Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask uh, the Minister what child protection measures has been put in place, uh, in, uh, particularly in country parks by NEAA, uh, in relation to educational programmes where uh, staff are working uh, with young people on educational programmes, sometimes from primary schools. I thank uh, the, the member for uh, his question and, and know this is an area of grave concern to the member, and it's one that should be of huge concern to all of us. It's vitally important that anyone working in or even being in a situation where they are with children that that person is properly vetted and that we could have full confidence that those uh, children will be safe. As regards the processes which NIEA or those charged with running the country parks, perhaps it, its councils, 
on other occasions have for that vetting. I'm not entirely sure, however, I'm sure at the very least it would require an access NI and PSNI check. However, I will be happy to get back to the member in, in, in writing with full details. Call Mr Spratt for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, given that the uh, Minister will be aware that a very senior member of Country Park staff was convicted of a very serious, uh, a number of serious child offences uh, and placed on the Sex Offenders Register for five years, I don't know whether that's a, a still working member or a former member, will he ensure that all staff are properly vetted and that this situation can never arise again? I thank the, the member for that supplementary. The situation to which he refers is one that caused me, as Minister, great alarm, as I'm sure it caused alarm uh, amongst parents across the land. Uh, sh shall we say it is something that we can and will learn lessons from. Your time is up.